Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this learning session about the Addressing Root Causes uh, program. Um, my name is Anna Gaumberg. I'll be your host for this morning. Um, I see still people are coming in. Um, I work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a learning advisor of the Stabilization and Humanitarian Aid Department. Um, and I'm happy to host this session with you today. Um, we have an hour to discuss um, uh, the Addressing Root Causes program and especially um, the feedback loops that have been provided or learning agenda that we um, organized within this program, how effective it has been and what we've been learning from it. I think it would be very interesting to connect it also a little bit to uh, the theme of today, obviously, about asymmetric power relations and perhaps also delve into um, what um, local uh, lessons have been feeding back up to a more higher policy level or not, and what have been um, opportunities, but also challenges for, um, um, for organizing for this. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll give the floor to um, Olivia Dawes, um, a colleague of the MFA. She'll, um, um, she'll first um, provide for an introduction and then afterwards we'll have a little panel discussion. Um, with some of our uh, partners. Um, before we do so, I know the addressing root causes um, uh, tender um, already was, I think, launched in 2015 and st the program started in 2016. Um, and I see many, um, I see many names actually uh, in my screen uh, that I recognize from uh, the, that time. Um, and it would be nice to see um, whom we're with here in this uh, group of people. And um, we'll, we're going to do that through a poll. Um, and let's see what has, your, has been your engagement with the Addressing Root Causes program. Um, if we could launch the poll, that would be great. Um, I think there might be actually quite some of you who've been there before and otherwise uh, we'll see. So um, the questions are, what is uh, your engagement with the ARC program? Um, you've, been, uh, you've, you've been involved as an evaluator, never heard of the ARC program is also an option. So we have quite a number of people actually never heard of the Addressing Root Causes program. Um, that's, uh, that's highly interesting. And um, um, I hope uh, you can learn uh, some of some um, things about this program and also we would be curious obvious to obviously to see what your questions will be um, to our panelists later on. Um, happy to have all of you here. Um, we can now enter into the next question. Whether you were present at the kickoff of the um, of the program itself, all right. So ninety percent wasn't there. It's all new for you. Um, That's, that's, uh, that's really valuable information for us, uh, for the speakers, for um, Olivia, who is going to uh, present uh, the ideas behind the Addressing Root Causes program. Um, so be aware that we have quite a number of people who, uh, who actually don't know about this program. And perhaps it would be nice to uh, give a small introduction on the aims and also um, especially, um, I think, 
the way in which we've tried to uh, include learning and ad adaptation in the, in the program design. Um, all right, without further ado, I'll give the uh, floor to Olivia. Olivia, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, yeah, so, okay, that is interesting that there's so many people who haven't heard of it before. I'll just say that the Addressing Root Causes program was aimed at uh, tackling the root causes of armed conflict, instability, and irregular uh, migration uh, in a, quite a, an array of countries. Um, it was a large program of, I think, 125 uh, million, so maybe that's uh, some interesting first um, uh, background info uh, to set you off. Um, I will mainly talk about um, how the learning component of this uh, art program actually was established and took place. Um, I was part of the art team at the MFA uh, during the tender process and the startup of this program in 2016. So I'll give you a, a brief introduction, but I'm also very interested to hear more of how this learning agenda eventually took shape. So I'll keep it, uh, keep it short. Um, from the start, I think learning and uh, monitoring evaluation and learning, so MEL, as we call it now, was a big component of, uh, of the Addressing Root Causes program. Um, at the time, concepts of learning agendas and feedback loops were only just gaining ground within our ministry. Um, I mean, within partner organizations, already a lot was being done. Um, but for us, it was quite new. And we had a great opportunity with the art program to build in such concepts uh, from the start. So it really was the first experiment um, of setting up a joint learning agenda for such a big program. Uh, and it was new to us as well, so definitely a learning curve. Um, the main goal for the art team was actually to use more evidence-based learning and adaptive programming to eventually, of course, enhance our collective impact um, with ARC. Uh, and the involvement of the uh, knowledge platform was, was key in this as they were our main knowledge partner um, with the key role in further establishing and feeding this learning agenda uh, as we went on. Um, so in May 2017, uh, it was just when after the art program took off, um, the MFA organized an event for male experts of uh, art grantees um, to discuss, uh, on the one hand, the uh, art common results monitoring framework uh, and reflect on it, but also to shape the form and the context of uh, content of a global learning uh, art agenda together. Um, and the goal was, I mean, our goal was to be as inclusive as possible, which I must say did prove a challenge. Um, we had country level meetings took place uh, with partner organizations that were um, implementing an art program in a certain country uh, with em embassy members pri uh, present as well um, prior to the learning event. So they could identify input for the learning agenda um, and for uh, to enable implementing partners themselves. Uh, to identify what lessons on, and research questions uh, would improve and benefit from further discussion amongst ARC partners, but also uh, with the knowledge platform. And we asked partners to share uh, two pages per country prior to the learning event, which sure served as input for shaping the discussions and the learning agenda. Um, I mean, I think the goal we had was to identify, uh, at least for that event, to identify which topics deserve collective learning investments um, and to establish uh, related learning groups and agree on the right mode of cooperation for learning going forward, because I think that system was also uh, very uh, new and we, we wanted input, of course, from the partners on how to set this up. Um, we also had a Klingendal expert talk about adaptive programming. That was definitely a new buzzword for us at the time. Um, and the idea was that the learning agenda would provide input that could be used for the adaptive programming by partners. Um, so during the event, uh, we actually established or partners um, established five learning topics and form learning groups in which uh, we had one partner be a lead or a champion. Um, these topics were not necessarily uh, set, but a more of a starting off point. Uh, and the idea was to stimulate learning at different levels. So on the one hand, in country between organizations and programs, but also definitely cross country at the thematic level uh, and program management level testing um, both assumptions and indicators and using that to tweak programs as we went along. Um, so we thought by having a partner or consortium as a lead or champion of each learning group, we hope to make it less of an MFA driven process and encourage broader ownership to make it more useful and valuable for partners themselves. However, of course, we couldn't really change the fact that in essence, it was instigated by the MFA and thus donor driven. Um, though at the time during the learn event, learning event, the interest and the will to build on this learning agenda concept really did seem, did seem there. Uh, I'm aware that the process from that point on 
may not have developed as we had foreseen also in terms of capacity and, and, and the way it was followed up. Um, uh, but I'm sure there are also many points of improvement to be, to be mentioned looking back on how we did it. Uh, but I do understand from those who took over the art program, so George, but also Aaron, uh, when I left that a lot of valuable learning has taken place um, and that the adaptive program approach has really been applied in many countries with good results. Um, so, uh, as I said, I think the, the knowledge platform definitely has a key role in this, uh, keeping the learning agenda alive. So it is quite fitting to have it here as a session session today. Um, and I hope this brief background helps set the stage for what's to come. So I'm really interested to hear how these expectations uh, and goals we had for learning were eventually um, put into practice. So thank you all in advance for your for your insights and um, I'll give it back to you, Anna or Erin. I think Anna. Thanks a lot, Olivia, uh, for uh, clearly setting out uh, the aims and objectives and also some of the challenges you already identified at the very start. Um, also the, the focus on uh, learning and uh, obviously uh, adaptive program. We're going to delve into that a little bit deeper for sure. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to reflect on those ambitions with a, a panel. Um, and um, for your engagement, I mean, we're quite uh, with quite a large crowd, I see, um, 44 participants. So um, for the engagement of others than the panelists, please feel free to pose your questions in the chat um, or any comments that you uh, might have. Um, leave them in the chat and we'll get back to them and include them in the discussion with the panelists. Um, other than that, um, I'd like to invite our panelists to the conversation now. Um, our panelists are Lisa Weigel from ZOA, uh, Osman Malim from Soiden, and Flores Dudanin from CARE. Thank you and welcome. Uh, good to have you here. Um, Lisa is actually with me in the room here. You see similar backgrounds um, and um, uh, the others are joining online. Um, great to have you here. It would be really good, I think, for us to jointly reflect on um, what the design of the ARC program has provided. So including its aim of allowing for flexibility and adaptation, uh, the global learning agenda as uh, Olivia uh, set out. Um, but also perhaps how it has provided for facilitating effective feedback loops with local partners and learning at the local level. Um, the, the conference obviously is all about asymmetric power relations and uh, the way in which we enter into partnerships and um, the equality in partnerships. It would be nice if we could also touch upon those issues a little bit while we're at it. Um, but mainly to listen to your ideas about what the strengths um, have been in this program, how it helped you uh, to achieve results and learn, um, but also what have been the challenges and what can we learn uh, from this for future programming. Um, so let's kick off with uh, Lisa. Um, Lisa, you're in the unique position to having been involved at the very start um, uh, from the MFA site and now um, having been involved in implementation of the program um, at ZOA. Uh, it would be nice to first listen to your um, reflections on um, the ambitions just set out by Olivia. Yeah, thank you, uh, Anna. Uh, yes, as, as you're mentioning, uh, I was involved in, uh, in setting up the art program together with Olivia. So it's uh, very nice to see you again, uh, Olivia. And after I joined, uh, um, I, I joined ZOA and I was uh, responsible for implementing the ARC project in, in Sudan. So one of the, um, uh, one of the things that, um, uh, well, yeah, that we set up front was um, that adaptive programming at the time was relatively new. And uh, we were also, um, we, were giving, uh, we were given a lot of flexibility uh, in our programs, but um, we saw that some of the systems um, were not ready. Um, so when, when, I moved to, when I moved to Sudan, um, I felt this was really a struggle that um, we were trying to embed flexibility within programs and really focus on results instead of 
targets instead of numbers. And um, I felt that this was really, um, in the beginning, this was a challenge that maybe I had not completely um, envisioned when I, uh, when, when I started. But I think um, um, when acknowledging that this is a challenge, um, reflecting back, I do think that it actually, um, that it brought a lot of focus on, on results and that with giving that flexibility in your programs, also the flexibility of shifting budgets, um, flexibility of um, adding additional activities or um, making mistakes as well. I think that's a very important part as well. The, um, being in, in a dialogue and, um, and talking about how you can make your how, how you can improve your projects and having the flexibility within your programs to actually do that i do think that it in uh, at the end it resulted in better um in in a, in, in a better project with better results um but it required it required a lot of steps um especially in the beginning and i think maybe the others also uh, in the panel uh, recognize uh, this Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, I, it's absolutely recognizable what you just mentioned. Um, I wasn't involved myself in the kickoff phase of, uh, of ARC, but um, yeah, um, having taken over the, the management of the ARC program in uh, uh, South Sudan at, uh, at Care Nederland, um, I can say that maybe one of the things that uh, was both a, a strength and a weakness at the same time of the ARC uh, programming was that it was very innovative, which means that um, it really was a, a big shift for many of the teams in the field that were responsible for both implementing the program and also for the, the m and framework. And uh, the m and framework itself was... Um, was ambitious and also yeah, much more complex than what uh, uh, the organization in the field was was typically familiar with. So I think that's that's not to say that um, that the learning uh, focus of, of ARC and the ambitious data collection that goes with it uh, isn't desirable. It's just that it requires also an institutional uh, switch. To, uh, to be implemented uh, strongly, I think. Yes, of course. Uh, thanks for highlighting that, uh, Flores. Perhaps, uh, Osman, you can also uh, provide for your first reflections and then we'll delve into uh, some uh, questions a little bit deeper. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, uh, our, our first uh, reflection on, on ARC, uh, I, I was there in 2016 when it was launched. And it, it really, actually, uh, uh, I've seen in uh, the ARC is adding a value to what already we have done in, in Somalia, uh, Sweden. For example, uh, setting up uh, what's called District Peace Committee, which works with the uh, EGAT, uh, it adds value to ARC project in, in terms of strengthening our, our capacity to improve the establishment of district peace committee and with this uh, contribution to the uh, respond to cause conflict in, in Somalia. And uh, the other thing that uh, art makes strength to our work is that uh, most of the Somali uh, leaders, they were more involved with in political reconciliation at the national level, they never discuss on the local level issues, but ARC raised that uh, there is a need social reconciliation than the political reconciliation in Somalia, which needs to address the local people, how they, uh, their grievance uh, in the past, how they uh, respond, how they actually uh, restore their trust because uh, this, the long civil war that we have been in Somalia, it makes a, a split to Somalia into clans. But the way ARC actually uh, helped to our work is that organizing people into a community level and, 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 and this is this communities helps them to break in the, the clan structure into uh, uh, community structures like 
discipline peace committees at discipline level. And so I think that's uh, what contributed and, uh, and strained our work to the art. That the challenge that we face that project is that uh, most of the leaders uh, they only focus in at the high level politics and, uh, and and security, and there is no any policies that support to the peace building process. So that was a challenge. How the, what's uh, what we have done at the local level to reach to the uh, high level uh, decision makers. Uh, it was really a, a challenge. That we face uh, during the implementation of of ARC project. Uh, so that's uh, what I had so far. Thank you. Thank you, Osman, for highlighting this. It also um, uh, resonates very well, I think, with the opening session we just had here. I don't know whether you were attending it, um, but um, the disconnect sometimes between uh, local level peace building and uh, and the um, um, the leadership level where, uh, where we tend to still focus on, um, on um, overarching um, uh, peace um, initiatives. Um, let's delve a little bit deeper into um, the um, addressing root causes program itself and your different um, or various um, experiences with um with this learning and adaptation i mean um lisa you already alluded to um the flexibility that has been provided in the program uh, flores you identified the challenges that were there in um in sort of organizing yourself also around these quite high ambitions that we set set out at the start um perhaps all of you can reflect a little bit on um how the program actually opened up for make, making mistakes. Lisa, you, you, you highlighted that in your, uh, in your opening statement, like how has it provided to actually, um, to actually reflect on those and, uh, and learn from them and adapt? Um, and in what way um, have you done so? Yeah, sure. Um, so, what is what is relatively new in the um, uh, in this in this program is that um, you actually that we have actually engaged in a conversation with with, with the donor on our results. Um, usually, um, donors ask for um, it's 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 more it's more com focused on compliance. It's more focused on uh, reaching your targets, and I think. Throughout the implementation of ARC, we have had conversations on uh, on results. L let me give you one one example. Um, just like Osman is um, um, is saying, we have also worked with uh, with local peace structures, um, and one of our goals was really to um, to stimulate female participation and active representation of women in these structures. And we all know that this um, is a can be very challenging. Um, we have had very open discussions with the yeah, with, yeah with, with the embassy, but also with some of our colleagues from other organization uh, organizations. I know some of uh, some of you are in the room actually, um, but we have had some uh, very interesting uh, also events co conferences uh, in Uganda and in Addis, uh, talking about how to stimulate um, active representation of women in these local structures, and I think. Um, acknowledging that um, this is not a linear process. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not telling anything new to all of you, but it can be, it's, it's, it, it all depends on the, on, the, on the culture you're working in. It depends on who you are working with and it should be a grassroots, um, it, it, it should be focused on and driven by uh, the grassroots. So I think um, talking from my own experience, I've learned a lot from uh, also colleagues from Somalia, colleagues from Uganda, uh, who were working in the exact same, um, on the exact same topics, but in different settings. And I think that has been very valuable, but um, also um, just acknowledging that things are um, maybe not as desired, um, is very is helpful in reaching your uh, results and i think um, i've been telling this example also to other donors i think that this is a this is a great example of how you can also how how, how you can manage or 
um, how you can manage programs and deliver better results. And I think that this is an example that other donors should maybe adopt um, and give that, flexibi- give that flexibility because it will lead, if, if people are open for this dialogue, it will lead to better results in my opinion. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Um, Osman, would you like to um, add to this? Yeah, actually, uh, and we actually uh, uh, sport, uh, sport art project and, and what we learn uh, uh, from the art project during its implementation really uh, it's uh, it helps to uh, Somali and government which is the federal government how to uh, uh, and as a role, art become a role model uh, for authorities to socialize, uh, to learn from, and the power decentralization program in the federal member state in, in, in Somalia. The way we establish the local peace committees, actually it helps to Somali uh, uh, federal government to take as a role model to apply uh, uh, district council formation. Uh, when I'm saying district council formation, and um, Usually, Somalis they share the power in the clan uh, uh, system, uh, which is very difficult to apply the clan system into administration level. But but what they, the way we used to establish the local peace committees under our uh, project, it really uh, uh, based on uh, social structures, not uh, a clan structure. Uh, there is a representation of elders, religion group women group, youth group, private sector, and IDPs, if there is IDPs in that district. So that's the way uh, our project uh, uh, support us to establish the peace committees into sectoral basis. And that sectoral basis helps a lot to the uh, form- formulation of uh, uh, district council formation in, 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 in Somalia. So I think that's something uh, we, uh, uh, we learned uh, that project, the way it also contributed other uh, activities that are going on in Somalia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Osman. That, I think it's a very nice example of uh, how uh, local initiatives can actually feed into uh, into broader initiatives. And uh, it's really great to hear that, uh, that the ARC program has been able to provide for that. Um, I would be actually curious to learn about from you also a little bit about the the challenges that you might have faced in um, um, in in uh, providing for this, and also the way in which you've been um, adapting, and uh, which you surely have been doing throughout the course of your program, uh, in order to ac- actually reach this uh, result. Um, but before we go there, uh, perhaps Flores, you could also um, tell a little bit about how you've been. Um, dealing with this flexibility that you've been provided for and also um, maybe also enter into um, reflecting on what Osman's been saying about the sort of ripple effect that it also may create um, if you focus on learning a little bit more and sharing lessons with others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, I would say that in the South Sudan context, uh, we can say that um, adaptation um, has been a very large feature of the ARC program, uh, but perhaps we can differentiate that it happened on uh, on two different levels. So on the one hand, there was a very much um, uh, a reactive component. Well, I suppose it was it was reactive in all cases, yeah. but on the one hand, um, there was a need for very rapid uh, responses to uh, to crises from uh, natural disasters such as flooding, but also um yeah interclan uh violence for example and this was not so much based on um yeah feedback loops and analysis of, of data per se but needed to happen uh very much on the on a on a uh, rapid basis uh, but on the other hand, there are many examples, um, and it resonates very much uh, with what Lisa was saying of cases where we saw that we needed to adapt some of the, the 
the products and the focus and for example the inclusion of uh, women specifically in uh, decision making and peace uh, peace processes was something that emerged very strongly and also on a more specific level um let's say some of the the products that we had um, envisioned needed to be adapted to the local context for example uh, a peace manual that was uh, was developed for the for the peace uh, committees um, we understood that it really needed to to be suitable for a largely non-literate uh, audience and so we had to um, adapt that uh, to that context so having it uh, yeah, suitable to the local context um, and then, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, your other point was about the ripple effect. Um, of course, I think um, we have definitely been been seeing that. And um, whereas the uh, the feedback loops within Arc in South Sudan were largely within the consortium itself, uh, we also did ensure that. Um, uh, the relevant uh, progress and uh, emerging themes were shared as widely as, as possible during consultations with uh, um, yeah, local government officials and, of course, during beneficiary meetings. So I think we have had a, an influence uh, beyond uh, the consortium, definitely, and, uh, and with multiple stakeholders who, for example, to these days use our, uh, our manuals and, and tools uh, beyond the ARC program. So I think by by ensuring that we were adapting to the local needs, we we did um, create some uh, some products that were uh, broadly broadly relevant. Um, if I may, there's one more point that uh, my colleagues who have been involved with implementation of ARC uh, for a longer time have really uh, insisted that I uh, that I stress, and which is the the learning groups, which um, of course were a very positive and strong feature. But um, I think one of the challenges that was encountered there is that with the learning groups, it wasn't always. Um, yeah, quite clear what the different roles would be um, in terms of yeah, facilitating um, the sharing of, of information and um, ensuring that uh, the learning groups had the required uh, yeah, clarity and, and focus. And uh, I think one of the, the feedbacks uh, from CARE would be that for future programming, it would be, for example, very useful to have a working group uh, focusing on adaptive programming in and of itself. Uh, but most likely this would require very strong uh, leadership and involvement either from uh, uh, KPSRL, for example, or from the uh, DSH, ARC Fund, or similar, let's say, in, uh, in future programming, because uh, I understand that um, yeah, the working group on income generating activities, for example, where CARE was, uh, was involved, um, it turned out in practice to be very difficult to share enough information and lessons learned uh, between the different uh, working group uh, stakeholders. And perhaps there was a, a lost um, opportunity because a lot of, of knowledge was there within those uh, partners and um, and yeah, facilitating more effective and more timely sharing of lessons learned uh, would really be a, a key point. Thank you for uh, highlighting this, uh, Flores, and also for highlighting the um, your dif differentiation within uh, between the different levels of adaptation and, and being flexible, uh, responding to uh, the actual changes in context, but also um, based on analysis and learning. I think um, the question that Lisa Danny just posed in the, in the chat is also alluding to this, like how have you been, um, how have you been able to also um, feed that learning into uh, adaptation perhaps, or, or um, um, reflecting on the assumption that the assumptions underlying your TOC and fundamental fundamental changes that that might um, um, be in need of. Um, I know uh, we've been speaking about this before within the within, within the addressing root causes uh, learning groups as well, um, and also I think that is um, 
taking place on the, at different levels within your own program, but perhaps also in, uh, in the learning agenda uh, overarching um, uh, the different programs within, uh, within um, the ARC realm. Um, I was wondering whether you, whether you could say something about this um, in response to uh, Lisa's uh, remark. Um, and also perhaps including Flores, the, um, the, the um, challenge that you just highlighted, that it's actually uh, important to, uh, to include those local uh, lessons and, and learnings. And I know we've been speaking about this before and it, is, it will be a challenge, I think, that we, that we will be um, delving into a little bit more also in the future, but how to connect those different levels of learning, like the, the very specific local learnings um, uh, that you uh, that you have your quick feedback loops for uh, while while programming but also the uh, translation of that into uh, the um, um, discussions about reflecting on your th theories of change mm -hmm. could someone of you say something about this right um, yes so if I understand it correctly um, you are uh, talking about the yeah the different levels of uh, feedback loops and and learning uh, in terms of on the one hand adapting to a specific local context but at the same time on a broader level sharing lessons learned and best practices with uh, with the other partners in different countries right yeah exactly but also what what might it mean for um, for testing the assumptions underlying uh, the the TOCs of the of the different programs yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what we experience in in South Sudan in terms of uh, testing the assumptions of the theory of, of change, um, it turned out that perhaps nothing we encountered really, um, let's say, went against the assumptions per se. Other than maybe on a very broad level, we found that yeah, the theory of change was broadly relevant, but at the same time. Uh, because as ARC, we couldn't do anything about, for example, the proliferation of small firearms uh, and even uh, uh, automatic firearms in the target area. Um, there was only so much we could do in terms of addressing certain root causes of conflict. But um, let's say the enabling security context didn't emerge during the time of the, the time frame of the, of the project. But other than that, I think it's not per se that we found any assumptions uh, underlying the theory of change to be incorrect. It is more that uh, we really had to tailor the, the products and the systems to the local context. So for example, um, one other thing that we uh, found was that the men engage um, model, let's say, um, which was thought to be uh, yeah, highly relevant, turned out to not be easy to implement because simply there weren't enough, um, let's say, role models that were suitable to uh, to highlight in the in the target areas. I mean, the uh, the the methodology of of uh, uh, transforming gender norms was relevant; it was necessary, but um, the assumption that we could work with um yeah locally based uh, role models to to promote certain best practices turned out to to not be so simple to to implement um on the other hand we we also um had some let's say uh, uh positive surprises in in the sense that we found that um the role of of vsla's uh could be uh, expanded and, and VSLAs could be a, a very good um, entry point and a contributing factor to social cohesion and even peace. Um, could you just, sorry, for, for our listeners, could you just uh, highlight what are SLAs? VSLAs, right. So they are village savings and loans associations. Um, these are groups consisting of normally between uh, 20 and 30 members, uh, largely women, but not exclusively women. Um, but these are, are community members who come together and um, essentially save uh, money together and then can take uh, small microloans from these joint savings. 
Um, what the VSLA methodology entails is that there is some capacity building and training on, for example, basic financial literacy and, and managing uh, finances at the group level. And what it then provides is a, a revolving fund where the, the members can, uh, can take out uh, microloans either to start businesses. Um, and this is one of the key strengths where we find that these, uh, these businesses, which are, uh, for example, kiosks or uh, sales of uh, vegetables or poultry or, or meat or fish at the very local level, um, these small businesses can create uh, cohesion, especially within communities where um, different uh, community members trade with each other, but in some cases even across communities. And, um, and so uh, it's an opportunity for women to be more economically empowered and enter value chains and, uh, and for members of different communities to, to trade. Uh, and also for youth uh, to find an outlet. Um, in many cases, uh, the opportunities for youth are very limited in the South Sudan context. So VSLAs are an outlet for yeah, bottom-up entrepreneurship and, um, and uh, for engaging youth. Um, and of course, because these are a small community level groups, they're also a great entry point for a lot of, uh, of training, um, including uh, training focused on, uh, on gender norms. Thank you, uh, Flores. Um, I'm uh, looking at the time um, and also at the chat. Um, there's actually one um, additional uh, question that might be interesting to ask to you uh, related to what um, uh, what Tawodros is um, is asking in the chat um, um, about whether whether we've actually now a working document on how to uh, how to implement adaptive programming um, and it might be interesting for you three the, all three of you to reflect on how how you've been able or um, um, yeah, how you've been able to institutionalize this knowledge that you've gained uh, with um, the work on uh, the ARC program and the flexibility that it, that it has been providing you and the learnings that you've been taking up clearly, uh, if I listen to you guys. Um, Osman, would you like to um, respond first to this? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, had that uh, during the, the ARC implementation. Uh, in Somali, uh, the way justice works is in uh, three ways. One way is the government justice system, and the other one is the traditional justice system, and the other one is Sharia. But the traditional justice system is very strong in Somalia. And the way Somali uh, solved the problem is uh, they more prefer traditional justice system. But during the implementation of this project, uh, we found that the traditional, system, traditional justice system solving, they, it's not documented and mostly uh, engaged by elders. So since the district peace committees established in the district level, they attended all the uh, uh, events uh, uh, solving a, a conflicts. And uh, they proposed to develop what's called peace diary, which recorded every conflict that was solved by the elders and also district peace committees. So the peace diary consists of uh, uh, who, who, who are the conflict parties, what was the issue, uh, how they solved it. They recorded all the, those uh, conflict resolution uh, at the local level which never recorded uh, before. So that record, we shared it to the local authorities for the future reference. And local authorities now actually adopted that piece that is very useful for uh, recording to uh, conflict resolution at the local level, uh, which was uh, not existed before, only remaining as a memory, those who were involved with the conflict uh, resolution. Uh, so that mediation. So now 
it's uh, it was recorded and, uh, and, and that document is in a, a local authority uh, at the court uh, district level and also to the regional level for future reference. And also it helps to the uh, government to find out uh, uh, how many conflicts actually uh, repeated and uh, coming again and again in that district. Then it helps in the future to address the issues that always uh, trigger to come back to those, uh, uh, the same conflict at a different level and, and different times. That's something uh, and, uh, that actually uh, and used to document it and learn from 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 the other project. The other uh, uh, learn that documented now is before most of the conflict mediation involved by the elders in, a, uh, in Somalia. Since the district peace committees established in a district level at uh, different districts. Uh, there is a woman who are member of the district peace committees. The, the number of peace committees is 15. So uh, the minimum member of the women are four. Some area, some district are six. Depend on how they uh, come from the different sectors. So therefore, now uh, engaging that peace committees, uh, that woman through the peace committees, it helps to restore the credibility of the elders who lost during the civil war their credibility to, to get trust from the community. Now, the elders, uh, they restore their credibility and, uh, and, 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 and women's participation in the, in, the, in the mediation through the peace committees uh, actually uh, helps the elders uh, to encourage and, 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 uh, and, and get the trust from the community. So that's uh, the two things that I, I can add. Thank you. Thank you, Osman. Um, uh, very, yeah, thanks for this. It's uh, really nice to um, to hear and learn from uh, how, uh, how your uh, program has been uh, creating so much impact in, uh, in Somalia. Um, Lisa, if you could um, perhaps reflect on um, whether this flexible programming um, has in one way or the other been institutionalized within uh, ZOA or whether you've been able to pick up the learnings from, uh, yeah, from this way of programming? Yes, sure. I'll keep it short because I know that we have only 10 minutes left, right? Um, so um, we were in the luxurious posi position because we had, we had three ARC projects. So um, we started learning uh, in ARC in Congo, in Ethiopia and in Sudan. And uh, there was a lot of contact also between our teams because we were all struggling with the same things. And I think this also links to the question of, um, of Jose about consortium, yeah, about consortium management because um, our standard practice is we design programs for a number of years, we set our targets and uh, during our biannual meetings, we, we basically discuss whether we have reached our targets or not, but the, I, I think what we have learned, and I think we are currently actually institutionalized, institutionalizing it together with the broker, Hannah is also referring to this in the chat. Um, we should ask different questions and also donors should ask different questions. The question should not be focused on, have you trained those 200 people? Even in your um, conversations within the consortium, which you probably have on a, like a quarterly basis, the question should be framed differently. Of these 200 people, how many actually have an increased income? And that's the, that's the discussion uh, that needs to take place. And of course you need to back it up with some evidence, but, um, we should try and change this system and also um, express this message to donors. And at some point, I know that we have this obligation to report to the parliament on also on, on numbers, but we have to educate and we have to, um, we have to show that these numbers people reached, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything. And we are actually achieving a lot of really, really nice results, but the focus is not on those results. And I think, um, so, okay, um, have we institutionalized it? Not yet. I think it all depends on the people. It depends on the team that you have on the ground. 
um, on, uh, it depends on their understanding. It depends on the, the level of flexibility that they feel and the level of um, that they feel that they have and the level of um, initiative that they have. That's so important to create that platform where people who are implementing the project feel that they have um, a say. And I think um, it all, it, that's where it starts. It starts with giving that flexibility and asking the right questions. And uh, of course, um, um, con in, you have to make sure that the projects that the, the beneficiaries are involved in this process and are and have a say in this process because they know best. So I think that's where, um, for me, have we fully institutionalized it? No, we are working on it, but I do think that we are making that shift and it's important that also the, the finance departments, everyone is, on, everyone is on board because it requires a lot of flexibility within your own organization and within your thinking. And I think we're getting there, but it's, it's a process. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Lisa, um, for this um, very enthusiastic pledge for focus on outcome level, uh, flexibility and local driven uh, change. I think that's actually a very nice wrap up of this, um, of this panel discussion. Uh, it links very nicely to what Osman has been saying about how local, how local initiatives actually impact uh, the district level in um, Somalia. And um, also, I think what we've been aiming for with uh, the Dressing Root Causes um, uh, program, uh, with all its challenges and um, um, learnings that we are taking along with us, um, Let's wrap up by giving Alex Gerbrandi the floor. Uh, he is um, Deputy Head of Rule of Law uh, at the Stabilization and Humanitarian Aid Department and, and will provide some final reflections from the side of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the Addressing Root Causes program. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I hope I can. Um, so I heard a lot of people were not uh, around when the ARC was started. I was actually around, but in a different uh, part, uh, department of the ministry. So I saw it a bit from, uh, from a distance. And, and of course, it was also set up in a political environment at the time uh, related to uh, the issue of migration. And then addressing root causes came uh, as, a, as a new topic. Um, I think uh, that was five years ago. We learned a lot on uh, program implementation, but we also learned a lot on the issue of learning and knowledge. Um, so within uh, DSH, our department, and Anna, you're strongly involved there, uh, we have a, a learning agenda, a general learning agenda, and also on security of rule of law, we have a long history of learning and knowledge uh, through the platform, but also working with uh, research institutions. So I think a lot of work has been done since uh, 2016 already. Um, I also would like to link uh, this interesting uh, discussion with a debate we had uh, one month ago on the dialogue and dissent strategic partnerships. And we had a similar uh, discussion. So a lot of issues highlighted here uh, were brought to the table there as well. Um, let, me, let me take a, a couple of things what I heard uh, during the discussions. Um, I think important what, what Olivia said at the beginning, that you should start and define, uh, let's say these kind of partnerships together uh, we can call it uh, co-creation or whatever yeah, name you give to it. But uh, it's, it's good to, to manage the expectations up front. What do we expect from this partnership? What are the roles and responsibilities? It was also mentioned uh, that on learning, for instance, the platform had a role to play. Um, but also from the ministry itself, the organizations, um, you need to know where the initiative is in, in these uh, issues. I think what also was said... Um, yeah, avoid to be over ambitious. Uh, I think you should dream big, but also implement uh, realistic. Uh, and, and I think it was also said, uh, keep in mind where your influences are, not of every, all things. For instance, in the theory of change, you, uh, you can manage, but you should keep it in mind. And, and not everything can be planned in advance. I think also you should allow for a lot of flexibility. The word of flexibility came along quite uh, 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 quite a couple of times and, and in that respect I think it was interesting what was also mentioned on the role of the ministry and our 
requirements uh, because we might be a bit ri risk averse sometimes. And it was said, yeah, it's about compliance, but, but also keep in mind the flexibility and uh, yeah, the relevance of dialogue and allow for adaptive approaches. And that I think is a, a, lesson, to learn, a lesson learned we should keep in mind. Uh, what was mentioned a lot of times was the importance of the country level, the context, the culture, and not, let's say, the national level, but also the local level. For instance, Somalia was mentioned. And of course, we should, in the end, keep the beneficiaries in mind. But that also poses a challenge. And that was mentioned that we, we have to be uh, accountable to our parliament and also yeah, present our results, achievements at thematic level. And that we also have to keep in, in the back of our minds. We are a political institution. So that, that I think is important. So sometimes that poses a challenge. Um, I think it, what I understood from the learning exercise in ARC that it took a couple of years to really get it, to get it done. So I think to avoid, let's say, a long run up to these uh, kind of issues that you should also allow for a good inception phase in the programs where you can develop these type of learnings, uh, approaches, and yeah, g give it a bit of time at the beginning and not wait too long for it. And, and then also coming back to be clear on your roles and uh, responsibilities in that respect. Um, yeah, and I think the flexibility also allows for experiments, serendipity. Sometimes you don't know in advance what's going to happen in these five years. So I think, uh, yeah, keep an open mind. What was also said, I think, is the, yeah, we, we have a tendency to uh, provide advice on our Western approaches, but also keep in mind the informal approaches and traditional approaches. And sometimes, as I understood from the example in Somalia, they can also be essentially be formalized, but take culture and local situation into account, I think is important. I think it was not mentioned here uh, too much, but it was mentioned uh, in the session I mentioned one month ago is the relationship between the ministry and the embassies and the important role the embassies have to play in being our eyes and ears when we have decentralized type of programs, but also they can open doors for organizations because they have access to uh, governments locally and uh, nationally, na nationally. So I think that that's important um, to also keep in mind. And lastly, I think that was important, what was mentioned about uh, the results and the results frameworks and not see it as a mechanism, but as a support uh, to understand what has been achieved, but also keep in mind the underlying na narratives and what's happened really on the ground and ask questions, why are results achieved? Why aren't they? Are those the results we expected? Are there different results? can we change um, and, and be more realistic on, on the level of results we, we expect? Um, yeah, two last points, I think also as lessons learned for the future. Um, I think that the, we now call it MEL, monitoring, uh, evaluation and learning. And what we're envisioning for some of our new programs is also to build in uh, yeah, strong components on, on learning. I've seen a couple of examples on that and also maybe to um, consider having uh, external facilitators, uh, which will keep the learning process uh, going, for instance, think tanks or a specific consultant from the outside to keep the ministry and the implementing organizations on, on track on, on learning. And lastly, um, the platform is also working on this cross learning uh, programs. And I think that's also important to see how we can learn from each other. And I think this exercise was a very good exercise in the whole ARC exercise and dialogue in the sense. So we have several programs we can learn from and get some generic lessons uh, from. So that is uh, what I wanted to Thanks. bring in. Uh, Thanks, Anna. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex, for, reflect, for your reflections and also highlighting some of the initiatives that, uh, that have been taken up already within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, at least. Um, and the learnings that you take away from the sessions, very important, I guess. Um, well, let's wrap up. We're a bit over time um, and we know we have a very tight schedule today, every one of us. Um, so thanks a lot, Lisa, Osman and Flores for joining us here today for this discussion. Um, uh, great to hear your insights and look forward to, uh, to working with you uh, in the future, I'm sure. Um, and everyone, 
thanks a lot and hope to see you later today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.